Hello out there in YouTube land, Mark Allen Gunnels here. My lovely friend Lex Jones has started a project that I think we are calling Lex Jones Christmas Calendar. Um, and he is trying to revive the lost art of telling ghost stories for Christmas. So he recruited a bunch of us horror writers and we are reading each other's stories. Uh, someone else read one of my stories, I'm reading another author's story, that author is going to read another author's story, and so forth and so on. Um, I think you get the point. So, I am now going to do my entry, which is a story by Alicia Perez. Um, up and coming, uh, look out for that name. Uh, Alicia's story is called Alice in Nightmareland. So, get ready, get a cup of warm tea, wrap up in a blanket, and let's see what Alicia has in store for us. As I was trying to get my breath back after a hard training session, I looked out of the spare room window a couple of dogs were running over the glittery, fresh grass of the school field. The gray sunlight gave the sight a sublime touch. Sad memories of my own took over for a few minutes, but I shook them out quickly. I didn't want to get upset. Not again. Like every Saturday morning, I had already been left on my own in that semi-detached house that had welcomed me so gratefully once, and that now was both my jail and my fortress. The day ahead, seemed endless, and I was not sure of what to make of it. I didn't know how long I was supposed to wait for, if somebody was going to pick me up to go somewhere, or if I was meant to wait there until tea time. As I tried to organize myself around the day, I wondered how long it was going to take for me to carry on living that way, weekend and week out, weekend in and weekend out. The weekdays were not a problem. Work kept me busy and distracted enough, even though trying to survive among the English office hyenas was a job in itself. Being a foreigner had become more difficult than I had originally expected. I was good, exotic entertainment for most, and a flamenco doll for my boss to bend and turn to the brink of isolation day after day from his fish tank office. Part of my mental sanity was there in that little room that I had managed to turn into a gym. The girls' bedroom, as they used to call it, was the place where I trained every other day without a rest in between to keep my mind content in its vessel. The physical wellness would eventually reanimate my brain, however, and despite all the efforts made, that state didn't, didn't used to last long. As soon as I had a shower and got ready to face the world again, I felt psychologically exhausted. As the days passed by, the clearer it became to me that ever since I had found out the real reason why I had been taken in, things had gone from bad to worse. Almost three years had passed since the day I had arrived into the family. I remembered melancholically my first memories of my arrival. Peter and his grandparents had collected me at the airport. Meeting him again after our summer romance was the most peculiar feeling. Outside the car window, the English rain covered the landscape like a veil, its transparency like a spark in my heart. I was going to be lucky that time because it was all new to me and I was new to everybody. My turbulent history was now in the past, buried back in my homeland, and there was no way back. My thoughts flew away while my new love companion shy, shyly glanced at me from time to time. There was so much we didn't know about each other. The night was over us when my eyes caught the eerie sight of tombstones and a graveyard war, war memorial statue rising above the rest, beautifully breaking the harmony of the view. Tong Cemetery was closer than I would have wished for as my final destination. My stomach churned when I turned my head to look back at it while driving down Denbrook Avenue, a quiet street with lovely little houses on either side. After the remains of the bad weather, and now well into the darkest time of the day, the air felt clean. From the vent of the car, a new smell of countryside, petrol, damp, and Indian takeaway ran through my nostrils in a rush. The trees down the road slowly turned their branches toward our direction in a gentle wave, moving the air produced by the car and the mild wind from the moors. Their long, their long arms let some brown and dry autumn leaves fall, while they seemed to whisper a November song as we drove through. 
The memory kept playing in my brain every time I felt I needed to make sense of my role there. The new page in the book of my life had started to cross out the initial excitement. Naivete and love in my chest, the hopeless and childish love I was so blindly trying to hold on to while daydreaming about its new future. I closed my eyes back to the memory as if to make it last a bit longer, trying to recall a sign that could explain it all. We had stopped at number 15, the house with the rose tree, the burgundy rooftop and the peachy walls. Like the other houses, this one also had a driveway for parking the car and two doors, one looking at the main street and another on the side of the house. There was a light between the garage and my nose that suddenly lit up, indicating I was the star of the day. I had the impression that a long time had passed from the moment it had started getting dark and the moment I had seen the cemetery, whose presence still lingered in my retina. The vision of it at the top of the street made me wonder, even now, three years down the line, if it had been a bad omen, a sign I shouldn't have misread. We walked down the broken stone path like if I had walked a catwalk. My heart was pounding so fast that I was worried everyone could hear it. The next thing was getting ready for that moment when you walk into a house and you sense either agreement or rejection from the building itself. The door opened and a new welcoming chill went from my spine to my forehead in a dizziness, four pairs of big blue eyes staring at me. A mixture of body warmth, the steam of cooking vegetables, and old used carpet worked together, forming an entity, almost shaping another member of the family. The couple of minutes I remained standing in the little hall felt like an eternity. My feet nailed to the floor were trying to find the adequate moment to walk into the lives of the people who, without knowing it, had already started to destroy mine. Three months had slipped under the carpet until my fiancé's family thought fit to let go the great secret they had been holding on too close for comfort in their hearts and under their roof. I did not know what had been worse, the secret itself or the fact that it was not unmasked by its beholder, but by Peter's now guilty-looking parents. His dad, with his usual square smile um, bushed under his mustache, was prepared was preparing what was going to be a little speech about his son's behavior. His wife, sitting opposite me in her armchair, gave short sips of her tea cup of tea while paying special attention to my reactions over the edge of her mug. He should have told you himself, but he was scared of your reaction, he proceeded, now a bit more concerned about my obvious and uncontrollable shock when finding out that I had been lied to about the real reasons why I had been accepted into the family. The room moved back and forth in front of my eyes as if someone had been holding a video camera and was doing fast close-ups and zoom-outs. He loves you, you see, added his agitated mother in self-defense, but every new word made me feel worse. I was embarrassed, upset, puzzled, and shortly after felt dizzy and sick. A recollection of flashbacks from our pure and unique romance kept popping into my head like pictures of an old album. We did it because he pleaded us to help him to bring you here, and also, also, the worst was about to come out of his mouth, also because you were the best reason to stop him from enrolling in the RAF just after coming back from holiday. After three years, the recurrent conversation kept playing on and on like a broken record in my head, clashing with the idyllic new start, with the perfect first days of my arrival. The differences were many and too great. Could love have destroyed all the walls? This is what I was hoping for with every new day, but instead loneliness grew among the green wallpaper and underneath the creaking floorboards, like a horrible requiem, making things worse, turning into a presence of, on its own, becoming the companion that talked to me while the tick-tock of my inner clock kept striking one minute, then another, then one more. While the hours changed the color of the sky, new hopes for a new beginning vanished into the next activity, keeping the train of thought going, unstoppable, hopeful, with every single detail of that conversation still very vivid in my head, accompanied by the most horrible gut feeling that corroded me day in and day out. The one and only little lie had brought other lies that had been adding themselves up to a never-ending list of disappointments. I blame my level of English, since the language barrier had been used as an excuse many times. Being made to believe that all the families in the UK live their lives like the characters in Coronation Street, Easterners, or Emmerdale was something that I was still trying to get used to. Girls' nights out, lads' nights out, 
drunken teenagers and not so teenagers, pregnant girls having secret abortions, cheap holidays under the sun of Malar Maraca or Barbados, and council houses for those who cannot be bothered working more than 15 hours a week. All the glamour that I had learned in my English classes and on TV programs at home had not taught me about the English meals, the timetable of the shops, and they had definitely not prevented me from the lies that my relationship was based on. As I used to do every weekend and as part of my feeling sorry for myself routine, I was coming to terms with the new reality. Prince Charming was probably only the product of a platonic desire, an illusionary fairy tale. I threw myself onto the couch with all the strength of my disappointment and looked at the world passing by once more and for the last time in front of the living room window, waiting for a sign, waiting for him again. Like my heart, the sun was getting ready for dawn and the gothic colored sky enlightened me to start another page of my diary where I could express the feelings of that life so strange is real. Kareng was playing its top ten hits in the loud background, the lyrics, I've become so numb, when I picked up my pen to give life to all those bottled up feelings inside of me. Loneliness sat next to me while I hurt, thinking how the ideal love affair with England had turned into this mockery, this canatonic state I had put myself in. I had become the prisoner of a psychological fortress guarded by dragons, witches, and hell dogs that were my fiancé's family. I was sleeping beauty waiting for the right prince to give me the love waking up kiss. I was a kind of modern angel in the house. I was a 27-year-old cantonal woman full of ex expectations and jeopardized dreams in the land of the Brontes, in a world that I loved and hated at the same time. I had turned into my nemesis. Alice in Nightmare Land. I flew my pen over the paper almost compulsively in a kind of automatic state where all my feelings and thoughts were going to be immortalized forever. Where nobody could stop me from dreaming and being myself, I started letting it all go in a one, in a writing trance, while at the same time a sudden embracing smell of home cooking tri triggered that first memory of the first time I walked through the door. I wrote freely. I wrote forever. Hello, babes. I'm home now. My fiancé's voice sounded like if he had been standing at the top of a mountain. I looked at my watch. It was 8.20 in the evening. I must have fallen asleep because my diary was lying open on the floor and my pen had rolled toward the fireplace. I tried to compose myself while he was taking his trainers off clumsily, bumping into the staircase. I could hear the fight of the angry, creaking old white painted wood due to the contact of his body resting against it. His gargles brought me back into the cruel reality, and his presence wiped out the slight hope of a gentle-like romance. He wobbled while coming into the living room, and from the door, a slap of alcohol hit my nostrils. I have been down to my dad's, and there was a party going on at Dave's. I have invited Charles to say tonight on me way. He won't be long now. You don't mind, do you, babes? He walked like a zombie, with breathing difficulties toward me, slow enough for me to realize how much fatter he had got during the last months. He had been eating and drinking uncontrollably, compulsively at times, almost trying to catch up with all the restrictions imposed by his father during his life. He was now liberated with me, and because of me, at the cost of my own freedom. There was nothing left of my beautiful DiCaprio look-alike, far too young for me fiancé who had physically mutated into this terrible, bad-mannered org. His charms had vanished at the very moment he had punched a hole in the wall too close to my face one day I had confronted him. He was now an untamed beast, shred shedding his meat suit in front of me while stepping into the living room, drunk, res reckless. I feared him. I feared his thoughts, his movements, and the air he breathed. You know who has had an affair behind her boyfriend's back? My own sister. My mom was telling me today, if you ever leave me for another man, I'll kill you and your lover too. He said that half laughing, half joking, with madness in his head, gritting his teeth. In the meantime, I was sat there, still in the drowsiness of my sleep, and just like that, the I possess you chain went under another lock, too heavy on my soul. He bent over me impregnating my breathing air with a stench of old wooden pub pints. You are never going to leave me, are you, babes? 
Eyes and smiles staring at my face. So close, so close. I was afraid of his spontaneous actions. He fed my fears when smiling. He had mastered the greatest control over my persona, my life, and the pin number to my bank card. I had to beg him for money to go shopping or to take the bus to town. I lost count of how many times I had walked home for two hours from work because I didn't have enough change for the cheapest bus. I didn't have friends of my own because he would come with me and monopolize and embarrass my evening. He had become my worst nightmare, a dark shadow always looking over my shoulder, the foe you fear deep down. And yet, yet I still wanted it all to be a cultural misunderstanding. You stink. I pushed him away, making him stumble backwards and treading on my diary. He managed to stop still. He frowned while bending his head down and reading out loud. I will one day find my way out of this hell. I will one day be strong enough to be in control of my life again. As soon as he finished reading the last lines of my diary, he took a deep breath, paused, looked at me with his piercing blue eyes, and proceeded to flood the living room with a coarse laugh. I now stood in front of him, in an attempt to pick my nakedness from the floor, full of hate and anger, my fists tightly closed and stiff at each side of my body. The air started thickening with a new smell of ghostly cooking, and loneliness started creeping inside of me so strongly, so intensely, that I screamed at him. For the first and last time, I screamed in a hard and loud agony plea, agonized plea for help that lasted what felt like an eternity. My nose started bleeding uncontrollably, staining my clothes, the carpet, and my destiny. I could taste its iron in my mouth, its warmth trickling down my chin. I screamed and I never opened my eyes again. I was gone forever, lost in myself, in that street overlooked by the cemetery where I was supposed to have started my new life. I was bygone, back to the tune of a new old song, back with the only one who cared about me, and where I felt safe, my loneliness. She's still here talking to me in her isolated times because I kept her, because I loved her from the moment she walked into my realms. That's why I saved her from them. That's why I took her. She was, is, a beautiful soul. She doesn't know she's gone, but she knows I'm with her. I still cook for her. I still comfort her. I still keep her company while she's waiting. When we sit together in the dark, I let her rest on my shoulder, and I whisper to her beautiful thoughts when she writes. She thinks I'm in her head, but she is really inside of mine. From the moment she arrived, she has been dragging me with her. There you go. That was Alice in Nightmareland by Alicia Perez. And uh, I hope you tune in and watch the other videos in this series. And thank you for listening.